Welcome in the name of Jesus to all of you, wherever you are, joining us in worship on this Passion Sunday. This is the day when we begin to focus on the cross and the suffering of Jesus in our preparation for Easter. We begin our reflections with words from the fifth chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. In his life on earth, Jesus made his prayers and requests with loud cries and tears to God, who could save him from death. Because he was humble and devoted, God heard him. But even though he was God's son, he learned through his sufferings to be obedient. When he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. Our first hymn expresses the paradox of the man who was God, meekness and majesty. And now let us pray. First, the Collect for Passion Sunday. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son Jesus Christ delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, 
we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Amen. And now a prayer for forgiveness. Verses from the psalm for today, Psalm 51. Please join in reading the verses in bold type. Be merciful to me, O God, because of your constant love. Because, because of, of your, your great mercy, mercy wipe away, away my sins, wash away all my evil, and make me clean from my sin. I recognize my faults. I'm always conscious of my sins. I have sinned against you, only against you, and done what you consider evil. So you are right in judging me. You are justified in condemning me. I have been evil from the day I was born. From the time I was conceived, I have been sinful. Sincerity and truth are what you require. Fill my mind with your wisdom. Remove my sin and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the sounds of joy and gladness. And though you have crushed me and broken me, I will be happy once again. Close your eyes to my sins and wipe out all my evil. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and put a new and loyal spirit in me. Do not banish me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Give me again the joy that comes from your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Amen. And let us hear God's promise. For when we were still helpless, Christ died for the wicked at the time God chose. It is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person. It may be even that someone might dare to die for a good person. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. And now Marjorie will read the Gospel for today. Our reading is from St John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Some Greeks seek Jesus. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip, he was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me, so that my servant will be with me where I am, and my father will honour anyone who serves me. Jesus speaks about his death. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me? But that is why I came, so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven. I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said to them, It was not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. 
Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. We sing the hymn, Christ is the world's light. Let us pray. O Holy Spirit of God, who inspired those who wrote the Scriptures, we pray that you will open our hearts to their truths and their truths to our hearts. For Christ's sake. Amen. The Message from a Seed We're thinking of moving. Not far, just downsizing. And in the process, of course, we have to declutter. Both moving and decluttering involved saying goodbye to old familiar things. To the house that's been home for nearly 20 years and to good neighbours. To possessions of all kinds that have been with us in many cases for all the 55 years of our marriage. And to some that go back even further, to parents and grandparents. And then we will have to get used to a new home, make friends with new neighbours, and maybe acquire some new possessions bought specially. It's something like this that Jesus is talking about in his message from a seed, although what he is saying is even more radical than moving house, which is said to be one of the most stressful things we can do. So what is he saying? The first thing we need to clarify is the nature of his death on the cross. His death is glory, not tragedy. This is one of the great themes of John's Gospel. He often records Jesus as saying, as he does here when referring to his coming death, that he will be lifted up. This term has a deliberate double meaning. On the one hand, it refers to being lifted up in crucifixion. 
But whenever John thinks about Jesus' death, he has lifting up in resurrection in mind also. So in his death, Jesus is glorified. Death and resurrection are two parts of one event. The cross is success, not disaster. Achievement, not failure. Jesus' cry from the cross, it is finished, is not a cry of despair, but a cry of triumph. He has finished what he came to do. As he says in verse 27, this is why I came. Interestingly, it is finished is the same verb in Greek as is translated in Hebrews 5 as made perfect, which I read at the beginning of the service. He has carried out the commission which his father gave him and which he willingly accepted. By his obedience, he has opened up the way for our relationship with God, broken by our sin and disobedience, to be restored. A while ago, a plumber came to replace a failed mechanism in one of our toilet systems. But when he'd left, we discovered it didn't work properly. He had not done what he came to do. Fortunately, I was able to compare it with a similar mechanism in another toilet and fix it. It turned out to be a bit of simple DIY adjustment. But we cannot fix our relationship with God by ourselves. The history of the Israelites throughout the Old Testament illustrates this time and time again. Time and time again, the prophets came and called the, old, the people back to the covenant, the agreement that God had made with them, and several times renewed that they should be and live as his people, and he would be their God. Time and again, they failed and broke it. That is what we mean when we say that salvation is by grace. We cannot save ourselves. We have to trust God in Jesus Christ to do it for us. So if Jesus had not done what he came to do, if he had not gone through with his suffering and death on the cross and been raised again on Easter Day, there would have been nothing we could do. We would be like the people of Israel in continual breach of God's covenant with us. Or listen to what Paul wrote, in the church of the church in Corinth, in chapter 15 of his first letter. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion, and you are still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in the world. Jesus' death is glory. He, di he did what he came to do, and we must therefore trust him. And he died so that many can live. We, as some of you know, grow vegetables. Marjorie takes after her scientist father and keeps records of many things, including our vegetable growing. Every year she draws a plan of our vegetable beds and marks where we're growing what. She records how many plants of each variety we put out and how much we harvest from them. For example, in 2019, we planted four courgette plants from which we harvested 38 courgettes. Jesus' message from the seed is similarly about planting and harvest, as are many of his parables, which is not surprising in, the, in an agricultural setting. In this passage, he is saying that his cross will lead to the birth of the church, that great company described in the book of Revelation as being so great that it's impossible to count. This isn't the first time Jesus talks about his death, bringing salvation and life to many, and that this is what he came to do. Mark records this saying in chapter 10, verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, he came to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. And this in turn echoes the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 53, verse 11. My devoted servant, with whom I am pleased, will bear the punishment of many, and for his sake I will forgive them. 
Here again we find the idea of the servant of God doing for others what they cannot do for themselves and doing it for many others. These and other passages in the sayings of Jesus underline what I've been saying, that the cross is where our relationship with God is put right, where we are saved, forgiven, redeemed. There are many different terms. And that there is no other place and no other way. We cannot do it for ourselves. I started drafting this sermon on the 8th of March, when the classic prayer in the Methodist Prayer Handbook came from Dora Greenwell, the 19th century author and hymn writer. It indicates how we should respond to the cross of Jesus. Draw us, O Christ, by grace irresistible, to the centre of all faith and to the heart of all sacrifice, to the deepest of all wells and to a work that is not our own, even your holy cross, to which we cling and by which we are held, for your own name's sake. Amen. It is only through Christ's death on the cross that we can live. That is where we have to put our trust. But to live, we must also die. This is what Jesus means when he tells people, as he does in Mark 8, 34 and 35, If any of you want to come with me, you must forget yourself, carry your cross and follow me. For if you want to save your own life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for me and for the gospel, you will save it. He puts it even more starkly here in John 12, in terms of loving and hating. But this is what true repentance is. It is as radical as that. As a seed is buried, in repentance we have to bury old ways of thinking, old ways of acting, old ways of relating, in order that a new life characterised by the new ways of Christ can grow in us. We have to exchange a way of life with self at the centre for a way of life with God and Christ at the centre. Swap a life that says, I can fix my problems, or science or technology or mindfulness or whatever the latest fad is, and the papers are full of them post-lockdown, can. Swap it for one that acknowledges that only God in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit can. Only God can let us back into fellowship with him. We have to trust him. We really don't have a very good term in this for this kind of turnaround in English. U-turn seems too gently, if you think of the curve of the letter U. The French volte face seems to me much more expressive. The idea behind volte face is linked to gymnastics. Think speed and energy. That's why I thought that my analogy with moving was only a poor approximation. But the idea of decluttering is more helpful. Even after we have made the decisive turn to Christ, we will keep finding things we need to clear out. As I said to Marjorie the other day, every time we walk past a bookshop, we ought to see whether we really want to keep everything on it. Passion Tide is not just a festival to celebrate. It enshrines a biblical principle of Christian faith and living to identify with. It shows us a pattern to follow. We need to make it central to our thinking and living. In Jesus and his cross is where we have to place our trust. The Passion narrative is the most important part of all four Gospels. They've been described as passion narratives with extending introductions. Jesus and his cross are central to Christian understanding, faith and living. This has been brought home to me by some of my recent reading in the writings of Tom Wright and C.K. Barrett, Alistair McGrath and now Dora Greenwell. So we end with her, this time not as an illustration but as a prayer. Let us pray. Draw us, O Christ, by grace irresistible, to the centre of all faith and to the heart of all sacrifice, to the deepest of all wells 
and to a work that is not our own. Even your holy cross, to which we cling and by which we are held, for your own name's sake. Amen. And now we sing a hymn of response. When I survey the wondrous cross, Our prayers today are led by Nigel Hardman from Nailsey. Confident that Jesus hears us, let us offer these prayers of intercession with open, loving hearts. After each phrase, I will say Jesus, and if you could complete with, hear our prayer. So, Jesus, hear our prayer. For all church leaders, 
especially Archbishop Justin Welby, Pope Francis and President Richard Teal. May they boldly lead, speak out and offer wisdom from the Gospels in these troubled times. Jesus, hear our prayer. For all people in positions of leadership, in particular the Queen and the leaders of all countries making up the world's seven continents. May they work tirelessly for peace and justice to ensure the common good for all. May they lead and encourage efforts to eradicate racism and the plight of refugees. Jesus, hear our prayer. For all families and communities who are finding life difficult at this time. In particular, the family and friends of Sarah and Everhard and all other victims of violence. And for all children taken into care and their families. May they know your love and compassion in the words and actions of those around them, especially from us. Jesus, hear our prayer. For all those who are working to care for those suffering from COVID-19, and for all those involved in delivering vaccinations, may you be their strength in these days. Jesus, hear our prayer. For all those who keep essential services operating for us, the NHS, the bus and train crews, shop and internet retail workers and all volunteers. May they experience respect and kindness from all who they encounter, again especially from us. Jesus, Hear our prayer. And for our own needs this day, a time of silence. And for all who have died and gone ahead, may they rest and rise in you. Jesus, hear our prayer. Now if you join me in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our final hymn celebrates what Christ has achieved for us by his death and resurrection. In Christ alone. Oh 
And now let us pray. Thanks be to you, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits which you have won for me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. And now by your passion protect us, by your wounds heal us, by your death raise us up, and bring us to life eternal. Amen.